on Facebook or who will watch later. Thank you for those who are here uh, in the sanctuary. Um, worship center, whatever you want to call it. The big room in the building. Um, let's, uh, let's bow for a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you that we can come and sing praises to you. We thank you that we can take some time on a Wednesday night to come to church together. Lord, we are the church, and we're here, Lord, to learn about you. We're here, Lord, to grow closer to you. We're here, Lord, to know you better so that in doing so, uh, our lives will be changed into the image of Jesus Christ. Lord, be with the students back at the K-House, Lord. I pray that they will have a good time tonight as they learn better how to study your word. And be with us as we go through Revelation, Lord, that you'd speak to us about our lives and about the world we live in and about what you want us to do and be um, until you come back for us. In your name, amen. Amen. Please feel free to either stand with us or sit and worship however you're comfortable tonight. Awakens, awakens, awakens me. 
Please grab a seat. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you. What an amazing truth. We thank you, Lord, that we have a God uh, who saw us in our sin sick condition, and he did not spare his own son, but sacrificed himself for us that we might be called your children. Your word says that God made him who knew no sin 
to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Thank you for the purity and holiness that Jesus Christ lived this life with. Thank you for his death, that atoned for our sins and his resurrection. That's the first fruit that promises us we will live forever with him. And Lord, as we open your, your book and we say you are holy, we want to learn about you and grow into your likeness. Bless our time together tonight in Christ's name. Amen. All right, please be seated. Thank you for being here tonight, and thank you for watching those who you're watching. A um, couple things just want to highlight. If you have any questions, you can put them in the Facebook comments, or you can wait. If you're obviously here, you can ask at the end of the teaching. Uh, next week, we're going to have a, um, a night of worship and communion, so I'd encourage you to come out for that. We're going to take a little break from Revelation and do some worship and communion. So that ought to be really awesome. So open to chapter 10, and as you do, I want to remind you uh, about the overview of the book of Revelation. And I know I do this a lot, but I'd like you to get it as much committed to memory or at least write it down so you have it and you're, it's available to you if you need it. Uh, chapter 1 is John's vision of Jesus Christ. So chapter 1, John's on the island of Patmos. And he sees the risen Christ. Now, John walked with Jesus. He knew him. He, 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 he lived with him for three and a half years. They ate meals together. They traveled together. He knew Jesus Christ very intimately. At the Last Supper, John was the youngest, so they're kind of all reclining. And he was leaning even against Christ because that's how they would sit around the table. John being the youngest, he would lean against Christ, who was the, sat at the head of the table. And... Um, so they're very close. Well, in chapter 1, he sees him in his resurrected, glorified state, really who he is right now, and he says he falls on his, on his face like a dead man. The glory and the awe that he had when he saw Jesus Christ. That's chapter 1. In chapter 1, he, he's told to write the things you have seen, which is chapter 1, the things which are, which are chapters 2 and 3, seven letters to seven churches. Seven is the number of completeness. And so... That's the things that are. And then it says, and the things which will take place after these things. And chapter 4 begins with after these things, which is a Greek phrase, metatauta. And so we believe that chapter 4 starts the, the things which will take place after these things, that chapter 4 is future. And so chapter 4, we see the church in heaven worshiping around the throne. Chapter 5, we see um, God the Father sitting on the throne holding a book which is sealed with seven seals written on the outside and the inside. And it's the document that is really the title deed, for lack of a better term, to the earth. And uh, Jesus Christ comes up to the Ancient of Days. We see this in Daniel 7 as well. He takes that title deed and worship happens in heaven. In chapter 6, he starts pulling those seals off, right? And he pulls off. A number of those seals, he pulls off uh, six of them in chapter 6. Chapter 7, the 144,000 are sealed, and there's a pause between the sixth seal and the seventh seal, which is the seventh seal of the seven trumpets. And so chapter 7 is a pause. Chapter 8 and chapter 9 are the six trumpets, respectively. And the first four natural disasters, uh, the last two deal with the demonic realm, chapter 9. Uh, chapter 10 is another pause. And then we're going to see in chapter 11, we're going we're gonna to see that the woe's over, kind of the middle of the chapter. And we're not going to see those, that seventh trumpet, which are the seven bowls of wrath, until chapter 16. So we will have a few weeks of kind of uh, a pause, and then then really getting some information out there that is not so much kind of in chronological order. So far, the book has been fairly chronological. We're going to have some periods where we look back at some events. Okay, so for example, in chapter 11, it talks about two witnesses, which will witness for the duration of the first uh, three and a half years of the tribulation. It's going to talk about um, chapter 12. It's going to talk about the woman, the dragon, um, and the child. And how you interpret that is very, very important. And we'll get into that, and we'll get into why we interpret 
the woman is this nation of Israel. Not Mary, nation of Israel. The dragon is identified in the chapter as Satan, and the child is Jesus Christ. And so that's going to be kind of a look back at human history. Chapter 13, we're going to see the beast out of the sea and the beast out of the earth. There's, there's two beasts. It's really the Antichrist, what we call the Antichrist and the false prophet. We're going to look at that. And we're also going to see a one-world economic system where all transactions are tracked by the beast, which is why we believe it's going to be a cashless society because cash is not tracked. Cards and electronic transactions are tracked. 14, we're going to look back at the 144,000 and kind of get an overview as to who they are and some more information about them. 15, there's worship in heaven. 16 is going to be uh, the seventh trumpet or the seven bowls. And there is a quiz at the end of tonight, just so you know. I hope you're ready for that. Uh, 17 and 18 is the fall of Babylon, the religious system and the economic system. 19 is the marriage supper of the Lamb and Christ's return. 20 is judgment in the millennial kingdom and a battle of Gog and Magog. 21 and 22 are new heaven and new earth. So that's kind of where we're going, if that makes sense, all right? Um, I was at a pastor's conference years ago, and uh, I had a friend of mine who I did not agree with. His, what they call doctrine of things that come is called eschatology, okay? So I didn't agree with his eschatology. I just didn't agree with it. And um, an elder from our church was there. And the elder stood there and said, this is why I believe what I believe. Revelation chapter 1. He went through all 22 chapters and gave an overview. And I sat there and went, I got to figure out how to do what he just did. Because I couldn't do it back at that time, even though I was ordained. I was like, I got to do that. So hopefully you all will be able to do that. And somebody's going to throw something out and you'll say, you know, I know the book of Revelation fairly well. And I can tell you that in this chapter, this is what happens. So, uh. Hopefully that's where we'll all get at the end of this. So tonight we are in chapter 10. Just to remind you, we've had, as these uh, tr trumpets are sounded, the fifth and the sixth, we see tremendous interaction with the demonic realm on the earth, okay? And uh, it's, it's a real realm. It's out there, and it's malevolent, and it wants to destroy each one of us. And they actually start to interact more with humanity in a more overt way in that chapter. Then we get to chapter 10, and it's really cool. Let's look at chapter 10. I saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud and a rainbow on his, upon his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet are like pillars of fire. So if you read that verse 1... It sounds familiar, right? It almost sounds like the description of Jesus Christ in chapter 1. And there's people who wonder if this is Christ. Now, I don't hold to that view, and I'll, I'll tell you why. When um, we get to verse 6, uh, the angel swears by God. And I'll get to why we don't believe that this angel could be Christ, because Christ wouldn't swear by God, and, and also Christ hasn't returned to the earth yet. Um, also, in the Greek, when it says another, it, um, the, word, the word there is another of the same kind of angels. It's not another of a different kind. So he's the same as the other angels that we've been kind of interacting with. Um, you may say, why is there such a reflection of who Christ is? Why does it sound a lot like uh, what we read this description of Christ? And I want to give you a couple reasons and then I want to talk about some of these things that describe him. Um, you will become like what you worship. Okay? So if you worship, um, fill in the blank. Let's say you worship, uh, I'm going to really convict people right now. Let's say you worship, worship frozen custard, because that seems to be a thing in Dayton, Ohio, Okay? We were in Cincinnati, and somebody said, where's the frozen custard place? There was one across the border in Kentucky. You get to Dayton, they're everywhere. Let's say, like, that's your thing, right? Well, it will change you the more you spend time with it and spend your money on it, and it'll, it'll definitely change you, right? The more you worship something, the more you become like that, right? So 
influences, things that you listen to, things that you watch, things that you take in, will be, you'll become like that. Matter of fact, if you worship Christ and spend time with Christ, the Bible says that you will be conformed to his image, which is God's will for all of us. So to see an angel coming out of heaven that has been with Christ and around Christ, reflecting Christ, that only makes logical sense, right? Whatever you worship, you will become like that thing. So he's coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud. And again, we think of a cloud as being judgment. And uh, Jesus talks about when he returns, coming with a cloud and great glory. He talks about that in Luke 21 as an example, that he'll return on the clouds. And it says, with the rainbow, uh, it says it was a rainbow upon his head, which I want to look that up. What does that mean, rainbow? There's something, when you study the Bible, there's something called the law of first mention. So you always want to know when something is mentioned, what's the first time it was mentioned? And what can I learn about it based on the first time it was mentioned in the Bible? Because there's something that God wants us to know. So I want to talk to you for a minute about the rainbow. All right. Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9, verse 11. It says, I will establish my covenant with you. This is God talking to Noah and his family. And all flesh shall never again be cut off by the water of the flood. Neither shall there be again be a flood to destroy the earth. Verse 12, Genesis 9. God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you and for all successive generations. Okay. So the law first mentioned, um, this covenant's for us, okay? It's called the Noahic covenant. And what does he say here? I will set my bow in the clouds. Now, what's interesting is <clears throat> we see a rainbow today and, you know, we're like, you know, you're usually out, you know, hey, pull over, I want to take a picture of it, or it's really cool. You know, in the ancient world when they saw a bow, what did, was that it? an implement of it was of war correct it was an implement of war okay I mean it would be like today if God would make a covenant and hang in the sky a, a AK-47 or something you know so he's going to hang his bow which is going to symbolize uh, to Noah an instrument of war but there's no arrows in it <clears throat> Interesting, because the Antichrist shows up with a bow and no arrows either. He, again, always copying God. I will set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come about when I bring a cloud over the earth, uh, that the bow will be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature and all flesh. Never again shall I, shall the water become a flood to destroy all flesh. Some people say, you know, that this flood was just a regional flood. We've had regional floods. How can you make a covenant? He's never going to flood the earth if it wasn't the whole globe. So when the bow is in the clouds and I look upon it, to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature on the earth that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth, that the bow, which is, as we know, a rainbow, when he sees that, he real, you know, he always, it's always a reminder to us and to him that he's not going to destroy the earth with a flood again, okay? So in heaven, around the throne, there's a sea that looks like a rainbow, right? And they, they say there's colors that we can't see with a human eye. I know there's sound we can't see, because we've all had a dog whistle and we blow air through something, we hear nothing and the dogs go crazy. They actually had a problem with that in school. They had apps that the kids could download that would have a ringtone that was so high that the students could hear it, but the teacher's hearing had diminished for those tones and the teacher couldn't hear it anymore, right? 
So you can look that up and see if I'm right, but something I read about. But the point is, is that, is that, is that there's this beautiful, like this angel comes and he's got this beautiful, all these colors of the rainbow as he's coming down. And again, it's a reminder that God is a God who will not flood the earth again. He has a bow that does not have arrows in it. And, uh, and so he is going to pour his wrath out, but this rainbow is a symbol of God's covenant of peace, of, of not flooding the earth again. And his face was like the sun. And so again, um, we think about the authority that comes with that. And his feet were like pillars of fire. So this tremendously beautiful, powerful looking angel comes down. Now, remember, we've just been studying about demons that are coming on the earth that are just disgusting and pouring out just malevolence on humanity. And then God says in counter perspective, here's a beautiful angel that's going to come. And you're going to take a look at him. And he had in his hand a little book, which was open. So remember the book in chapter 5 was a sealed book, and this is an open book. And he placed his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and that would be the Mediterranean Sea. So it's that idea of authority, and the Lord God created the land, dry land. He created the sea and all that's in it. All of it is God's, and this angel, as an emissary of God, is standing, showing authority by putting his feet on both, the sea and the land. Anybody see what happened in Beirut yesterday? That was pretty scary. Yeah. And they initially said it was a, um, it was a fire, it was, it was a firework factory. So, you need to figure out what was going on there. Um, right now in Lebanon, they only have power two hours a day. I saw a video of people driving late at night in Lebanon, like after the sun goes down. No street lights, no, 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 street, no street lights and no lights to tell you when to go and when not to go. Um, two hours a day, that's what they have. Pray for Lebanon. It used to be a Christian nation or a nation that was, it was the nation in the Middle East for Christians. Uh, Christians got, have gotten, by and large, run out of Lebanon. It's controlled right now by Hezbollah, which is a client. Um, it's kind of a client for Iran. Uh, Shia has a tremendous uh, presence there. And, uh, and that nation is in just, just peril right now. And if you think about it, the sea that this angel is going to put his foot in, if you're reading this in the first century, it's going to be the Mediterranean Sea. Right, the Mediterranean Sea, which we saw with the explosion in Lebanon, because it's Beirut, it's on the coast, it's the Mediterranean Sea, and then on the land to show God's dominance over both um, <clears throat> both locations. And uh, his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he cried out with a loud voice, as when a lion roars. I mean, this is a, you know, we have this picture of angels, you know, these little angels that they sell at the, at the store that have, you know, this little baby looking thing, like a little cherub with wings. And um, uh, every time an angel shows up in scripture, what do they say? They always have one line. Don't be afraid. Okay. If it's, if it's a little chubby baby with the harp and wings fl fl fluttering around, who's going to be afraid of that? Well, like no one, okay? When we see an angel, uh, we see somebody who God has created to, to protect his people. It's in Hebrews chapter 1. That's what their role is, is to minister to those who will inherit salvation. And, and the angels are actually told to worship Christ. That's, again, that's a verse that, you know, Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and everybody who doesn't believe Jesus is God, God tells the angels, uh, worship the Son, which means the Son is God, because only God can receive worship. Um, they're very powerful, and they're very awe-inspiring. Okay, so this angel comes down, and he puts his feet down, 
and he's got a book in his hand, and John's, you know, and then he roars like a lion, which has got to be incredible. And when he cried out, it says seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. So there's seven thunders. In verse 4, it says, the seven peals of thunder had spoken. I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken, and do not write them. So we don't know what the seven peals of thunder say. I, I don't know what they say. It doesn't, it, John's going to write them, and then they say, no, don't write those. So when we get to heaven, uh, we'll have many things to learn, and one thing is the seven peals of thunder. What did they actually say? Because we do not know. Um, it's interesting because John is, what we read in Revelation, John is told to write. Okay, this is not a made-up book. It's not something he thought, I'm going to write this. Or This is God saying, write this, write this, write this. Here's this vision, here's this vision, here's this vision. He sees this and God goes, actually, no, don't write that down. Just don't write that down. This is where I lean on Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord. We don't know why he did this. We just know he did. Those things that are revealed belong to us and our children. Deuteronomy 29, 29. It's a great verse. All right, so do not write them. So he tells him, uh, do not do that. Um, it's interesting because it says, the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever. So the angel swears by God. And if we, if we think about the covenant that God made with Abraham, uh, you know, you, like when we take an oath, uh, if you go to court and they say, you know, you put your hand on a Bible, so that's an authority above everyone. At least that's, what, that's the imagery. That's why we would do it. And, you know, I, I, I promise to tell the whole truth and, and nothing else but the truth. We're swearing an oath, saying that we're going to not lie, we're going to tell the truth, and we're doing it based on the fact that we're swearing by the authority of the Bible being the authority of God. In the time of Christ, they had a very intricate system of swearing. So somebody would say, you know, I need you to do this for me, and they'd say... If I swear by the temple, that's sin. But if you swear toward the temple, you, you can say you'll do it and you won't do it. They really used, that's why in the Bible it says do not take oaths, do not swear by things. Um, because people would use that and they kind of abuse it. Um, this angel is not Christ because it says he swears by him who lives forever. And in the book of Hebrews, we have an explanation on this. Hebrews chapter 6 and it talks about this. Verse 13. When God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by none greater, he swore by himself. Saying, surely I will bless you, and I surely will multiply you. And that's uh, right out of chapter 22 of the book of Genesis. So again, who could he swear by? Could swear by anybody greater than him, because he's the greatest. So he actually swears by himself, right? When we make an oath, we make an oath based on something greater or someone greater. And so we see in chapter 10 here, verse 6, that the angel swears by who? By God, by him who lives forever. That's obviously God and Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to clarify. So just in case you don't know who I mean by him who lives forever, who created the heavens and all things in it, the earth and all things in it, and the sea and all things in it. So he is swearing uh, by the Lord. And when we think about, um, you know, we think about the idea, you know, Christ, God, the Holy Spirit, they are the, the, the ones who created what we see in the earth, right? I mean, God spoke, I believe that's the voice of Christ, and I think that everything became what it is because of them. So he's swearing by him who lives forever, who created all things, and he's swearing. And what's he swearing? That there were, will be delay no longer. 
So what he's saying is he's saying that everything that we've been looking at is going to finish up. It's going to have a conclusion. As a matter of fact, he goes on to say, in the days of the, uh, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he was about to sound, the mystery of God is finished. So Revelation 16, uh, verse 17, as things are getting poured out, it says this. It says, the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple on the throne, saying, it is done. When Christ sacrificed himself on the cross, he says, it is finished, paid in full. I paid the sin debt in full. As we start walking through Revelation, by the time we get to chapter 16, uh, verse 17, the angel says, it's done. The, the wrath is being poured out, and it's all, it's, the wrath's going to be done, okay? And going back to chapter 10, he says, the mystery of God is finished, that at some point, the evil is going to get destroyed in this world. All evil is going to get destroyed. Um, there's a lot of evil in this world, a lot of evil. I wouldn't encourage you to, but if you've read anything about what's going on with Jeffrey Epstein's girlfriend or whatever she was, Glaine Maxwell, um, you know, there's a lot of evil in high places, okay? There's a lot of evil in high places. Um, the Lord is gracious. He's patient. He wants people to repent. But if they continue to choose not to, he's going to wrap up this evil world and take his children to the next world uh, where there will not be the evil that we have here. So he says here... Um, it says the mystery of God is finished as he preached to his servants, the prophets. So don't miss that through the whole Bible, that Revelation is actually the culmination of the whole Bible. And it talks about what's in the whole Bible. It talks about the gospel. It talks about people coming to Christ. It talks about God's free gift of salvation. And it also talks about the fact that God's a just God and he has to punish sin he has the right. He has the authority. Um, when, we, when we quote 1 John 1, 9, and we talk about the fact that if we confess our sins, he is faithful. It means he will do it. And just, that means he has the right to do it, to forgive us of our sins. And then to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's because he has the ability to do that. No one else. I mean, that's why Jesus claims to be God by doing what? Somebody sins against another person and Christ looks at the person who sinned against the other person and looks at them and says, I forgive you. Think about if two people in the church came to me and one had sinned against the other one and I looked at the person who sinned against the other one and I said, I forgive you. They'd be like, I didn't, you really aren't involved, <laughs> right? But because Jesus being God says, your sins are forgiven, I forgive you. He's putting himself in the place of God because all sin is against God, first and foremost, and then against whomever we sin against. So, all right. So, um, this has been the theme of the Bible God's reconciliation of his people, God's uh, righteous judgment on sin, that sin is going to be done away with, that sin is temporary, that evil will be dealt with once and for all. You know, um, I don't expect you to know this, but there was something called the April Thesis. So when the czars were overthrown in the Soviet Union, well, in, in Russia, um, they had democratic elections in 1917 in the early part, and socialists named the Mensheviks took over, and they were more democratic, and they were more in interested in having good relationships with other nations. And... Uh, uh, Lenin came on a train funded by the Germans, snuck in by the Germans, actually, um, back to Russia to, to preach his version of uh, communism, so drastic kind of socialism. And, um, and he produced something called the April Thesis, which you can look up and read yourself, okay? And he called for, um, well, he called for like a standardized wage, just in case you're following the politics in America, that may sound familiar to you. He called for um, destroying the military, doing away with the military. 
and he called for abolishing the police. It was 1917, okay? So I say that to say this. Um, our world, the problems we see with lawlessness just gets recycled. That's all it does. It just recycles. That's all. You know, we hear people today saying that we need to abolish the police. Okay, well, what authority do we have? Do we have, we used to have the authorities, think about this. We used to have, the family was kind of an authority piece, right? I'm just old enough to remember that in my high school when, a, you know, a friend of mine would do things that were a little over the edge. I remember my teacher saying, I'm going to call, give your dad a call, and he'd get in line, right? Um, there was kind of the family authority piece. Uh, the church is an authority piece to hold back sin, right? So you got the family that has a redemptive quality, even in families that don't believe in the Lord. They have a, have a, have a, a redemptive kind of um, at least order and moral quality. Same thing with the church body. We should be like salt and light and help the world um, to hold back the evil, and then you have the authorities. Romans 13 talks about the fact that authority is put in place to punish evildoers and to reward good, work, good deeds. Like, read Romans 13. It talks very clearly about what the authorities are to do. And it doesn't mean that police officers don't do wrong things. They do. They're sinners. They, and they're bad police. They're bad cops. I can tell you a story about a couple, some stories. But, but the point is, is that, that God put that in place so there'd be authority to keep order in a society, right? And so the goal of evil is lawlessness. Lawlessness. That's always the, always the goal. Satan loves lawlessness. And the Lord is God of order and peace and structure. So um, back to uh, verse 7, that this message, that this mystery of God is finished as he preached to his servants, the prophets. And it says, the voice which I heard from heaven, I heard again speaking with me saying, go take the book which is, in, uh, which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land. So John is told to go take the book. It says in verse nine, so I went to the angel telling him to give me the little book. And he said to me, take it and eat it. So there's a couple, there's a, a number of times in the Bible it talks about um, ingesting God's word, right? Jeremiah uh, did in chapter 15. It talks about it in Psalm 119. Um, Ezekiel was told to eat God's word. And, and again, that idea that we don't just read it, we actually ingest it. It becomes part of us. It becomes part of who we are. That's why we study it, because as we study it, it gets in our minds, and then our minds start to in our thinking and in our, in our responses, the word of God should be, be there. And so then it should change how we think and what we say and what we do. And so he says, take this and eat it. And he says, it will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. Um, so this is Revelation 10, 9, I always think that this is funny because how many times have you eaten something that's really good in your mouth and it makes your stomach sick, okay? This is where I say Doritos are in the Bible because everybody loves eating Doritos and then it's a stomach ache, you know? It's like eat the Doritos and then the antacids because they're kind of a science experiment those things are. But the point is, is this book, when he eats it, it's sweet as honey because it's God's word. But in his stomach, as he processes it, it's going to make him, him sick. And the reason it's going to make him sick is because God's word is pure and beautiful. But as we move forward in the rest of this, we're going to read what he's eating. And that's in verse 11. And they said to me, you must prophesy again concerning many peoples, nations, and tongues, and kings. So John realizes that he eats this book and is making his stomach sick that he has to still say more prophetic truth about humanity. Like, like we've had the seals. 
we've had the six trumpets. And he's like, actually, there's going to be more wrath that's coming. And so in John's stomach, it, it, it's, you know, and, and why is that? God takes no delight in the death of the wicked, and we should neither. Like, as we read this, we don't think, wow, man, people are going to get what's coming to them. We think, um, we need to think that we pray that people come to Christ by being, by going through this. All right? That's my prayer, is that people going through this wrath of God would come to the Lord and find his forgiveness. Jesus said, or the Bible says that the Lord doesn't want anyone to perish. It's not like if somebody goes into hell, God's like, yeah. I mean, God doesn't create human beings to send them to hell. But when people choose to reject him their whole life, he's also gracious enough to say, I'm not going to force you <laughs> to live with me for eternity when you've never wanted anything to do with me your whole life. And so John, as he starts to realize that there's more coming, it, it's, he has a visceral response. And we should, we should look at this book that way too. It's, it's, it's a very sweet book because it's about God's plan being completed. But in our stomachs, it should, it should kind of, some of it kind of should turn our stomach to think that people are going to have to go through this and suffer in these ways, right? You know, I mentioned um, Lebanon. It's interesting because Lebanon used to be like Beirut was the Paris of the Middle East, Okay, very advanced nation. Obviously, we know about the cedars of Lebanon from the Bible. Not good land. Peace, it was very peaceable. I think they had peace with their, their neighbors right on the coast. Very blessed land. And they had all these Christians that were there, and, and, and God's blessing was on them. And, and as they ran them out, and as they democratically elected Hezbollah, <laughs> okay? Um, so, like, the people who lead them now were democratically elected, but they elected terrorists. Uh, it, is, it is a nation that is absolutely crumbling right now. And I say that to say this, not to, not to point out and say, look at how bad they are, but to point out and say this. If we choose, as people, if we choose the path that God gives us a blessing we'll be blessed. If we choose the way of pain and the way of trial and the way of, of, of sowing, as the Bible says, you sow to the wind and you reap the whirlwind, that's what they've done in Lebanon, right? Like I remember when they elected Hezbollah, I, I, I went, they, they went to the polls and they elected a terrorist organization. What do they expect? Where do they think their money's gonna go? It's gonna fuel terrorism. So I say all that to say we don't want to, you know, look at people in judgment and, and celebrate their pain. We always want to go back and say um, there's God's grace. And as we get into chapter 11, we're going to read more about God's grace in the book of Revelation. But this little book, which is fascinating, is, is this angel comes and says, John, take the book, eat the book. And it says, you must prophesy again concerning many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. So this, this wrath that's poured out is not just on the Jews. It's not just on the Middle East. But it's many peoples. So lots and lots of people. All the nations of the world. Many nations, many tongues, and many kings and many people in authority. So there's a, a universality of what's going to be poured out. It's not just limited to the Middle East. It's not just limited to the Jewish people at this time. And this is why I believe it's a future event for so many reasons in the book of Revelation. But that verse tells me that he's not prophesying about a specific king. He's prophesying about many kings and what's coming in the future for them. You know, the funny thing is, is that what do we deserve? We deserve death. We deserve hell, right? I mean, we want God's mercy. If I stood before the Lord and he said, Peter, on the basis of your righteousness, you can come in, a, in, in into heaven or not. Well, who, who here is going to pass that test? Well, let's just say this. I know I'm going to fail. You guys may be better than I am. I, that's, that's cool with you. Maybe you're, but 
It says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we all deserve eternity without God. But God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law at just the right time, out of Galatians 4. And, and, and so he came at just the right time to be born and to die for us. So that the gap between our filthy rags that are our righteousness and his righteousness, he would bridge that gap. So the only way we can spend, the only way we can go into eternity with the Lord is because we're clothed in his righteousness. So we don't deserve heaven. It's a gracious gift. And anybody you know can receive that gift when they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. The people in Revelation have made the decision to not put their faith and trust in Christ. And Christ is offering over and over and over again. We're going to get into 11 in two weeks, and we're going to see that he's offering the gospel over and over and over again. That's his grace. That's his mercy. Um, he has not hidden from us his message. Uh, it's, it's right out in the open. All right, so let me pray, and then we have a little bit of time for questions. Um, so you can put those in, in the, the Facebook chat, or you can text 618-3030. You can text 937-618-3030. Or Dan's going to walk around with a mic, and you can ask for those of us who are in-house. Lord, thank you for this chapter 10, John the, John the angel in the little book. And thank you, Lord, that you're going to complete your wrath, that if one day this is all going to be wrapped up, that you're going to righteously judge the earth that in so many ways has decided to live in rebellion against you. Thank you that you're righteous. You have the right to do it. Thank you that you're just. You're going to do it justly. And thank you that as we think about it as your people, your word is always sweet to us, Lord. But this part does kind of turn our stomachs, Lord, because we think about what people are going to be faced with. And I pray that those that we know and we love who have not turned to you, Lord, will. That they will. And, and I love how your word says be saved from this, the wrath to come. That Christ saves us from the wrath to come. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. You came from heaven so we'd be clothed in your righteousness. Like the angel of death that went out through Egypt. And if we had the cross, the blood of the cross on the doorpost. It made a cross symbol and it was the blood of the lamb <laughs> that they had. And it symbolized the cross where Jesus would die, you know, 1,400 years later, and yet it, you passed over. So, Lord, thank you. Thank you that you do not remember our sins. You don't remind us of our sins, Lord, that we are cleansed by the blood of Christ. And I pray as we think about what's coming that it will give us further impetus to share the gospel with people to talk to people about how great you are. Lord, we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So um, I don't know if you've watched sports lately, but there are no fans at any sporting events, which is really awkward. So whenever something happens that the fans would usually cheer or, you know, they'd make some reaction, there's someone who has that recorded, and then I guess they hit a button on a computer, and then they kind of get that sound effect. So I'm thinking about having that where I could just point to Dan and we should have like an amen. 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 Right, Dan? We should do that? Yeah, we, should, we, we have to record one and you can just hit the button. It's just whenever I point. It's like, like the sound effects of the games. All right. So what, what questions do we have tonight? Are there any questions? Yes, Ed. Okay. So bear with me. Sure. Um, in Ezekiel chapter 2, yes, Ezekiel is, is instructed in a very similar scenario to eat a scroll. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because it contains some prophecies or judgments against Israel that aren't ready to be revealed yet. It's, I guess that's my interpretation of John being instructed, that there's some prophecies that he's not supposed to yet reveal, so he's ordered like a spy, read this, and then eat it so no one can see these prophecies. It's, it, I think that's a little different interpretation than what you gave us, and I'd like you to help straighten me out. 
Yeah, well, I mean, definitely in Ezekiel 2, um, he says, I'm sending you to the sons of Israel, a rebellious people who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. I'm sending you to a stubborn and obstinate children. And he's told to say, you know, thus saith the Lord. And, you know, he's, he says, uh, it says, you shall speak my words to them, whether they listen or not, for they are rebellious. Now you, son of man, listen to what I'm speaking to you. Uh, do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I'm giving you. And then I looked and behold, a hand was extended to me and lo, a scroll was in it and he spread it out before me. It was written on the front and the back and written on these lamentations, mourning and woes. So it goes on in chapter three to say, then he said to me, son of man, eat what you find, eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he fed me the scroll and he said to me, son of man, feed your stomach, fill your body with this scroll, which I am giving you. Then I ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. And then he said to me, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak my words to them. Um, so what's interesting is, you're right, he's given a scroll to eat, just like John is. And he's given a prophecy through a scroll, just like John will do. And then, you know, he's to eat it, and then he's to go communicate it and that, and that's kind of what John's doing John eats it and then he says you've got to at the end of there he says you must prophesy again so you prophesied all the way through chapter 9 and there's a pause hey John the book's not done we've got more chapters to go right and so it is it's a little like Ezekiel because he ate it and then he prophesied to to God's people so and they were rebellious, and I think they didn't, they didn't listen either. I don't know, does that make sense, Ed? Is that, so, um, it is interesting because uh, when you look at Ezekiel, Jeremiah, there's some overlap as far as consuming God's word that way and then, uh, and then speaking it out. So, all right, are there any other questions or thoughts? Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't see anything in the comments. All right. All right. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's close in prayer then. Um, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth, Lord, that's in it. Um, we thank you that you, Jesus Christ, are the center all of, of all history. We set our calendars by you, your, your life, death, and resurrection. And Lord, that central, you are the central figure in human history. As we look back through time, um, Lord, it's all about you. You're the one who was and is and is to come. And so we come to you as your people and we say, Lord... Um, help us to consume your word like John. But Lord, help us to communicate it as well, to tell people, Lord, what's coming. There's a glorious future for your children and for those who choose to rebel. Um, there are difficult days ahead. So Lord, thank you. Thank you for your goodness and your graciousness and your kindness and your love. And thank you, Lord, that... Uh, you have promised us that you will be with us through whatever we face. And I pray tonight as a church that we would just know that, that we would know that in these days that are very unsettling, days that we find ourselves in places and going through things that we did not foresee back in February, or the beginning of March. But Lord, we know that you have a plan and we know that your plan is good and we know that your plan is to bring yourself ultimate glory. So Lord, help us as your people to continue to trust you and walk with you and communicate your truth to those around us for your sake. We ask this in Christ's name, amen. Amen, thank you.